Good evening, everyone. Awesome. Quick uh, context uh, for our game plan for this evening. We've got about uh, 85, 90 minutes together, which is an awful lot of time uh, to commit to each other uh, in, in the, at the end of a long day. Um, I'm going to do some quick table setting uh, for what we're going to be talking about. Do a short intro and sort of Q&A, like I'm trying to channel Charlie Rose as best as I can, and encouraging them to interrupt each other and me and all that, and so you can sort of be a part of a, a more what might be more of a candid conversation between three pretty incredible uh, CEOs with really diverse businesses. Um, uh, and then we're going to break it out to do something a little bit odd, a bit of a tightrope walk, which is to engage you in, in not just watching us have a conversation, but to actually be part of uh, a group brainstorm on how we can uh, uh, unleash the redeeming power of capitalism together, because we don't presume that the answers are on the stage. Um, there's a lot of wisdom in the room. Uh, some of it is up here, uh, but probably not uh, the majority of it. And so we want to try to have the conversation be pushed out into small groups here, which will take an awful lot of dexterity on all of our parts and some moving of chairs uh, where, where the, the panelists will go out and try to engage with you in that conversation and then sort of do some live sharing across. It could be a real mess, actually. <laughs> we, we are, we are, we, we, I think that three of us sort of share something in common, which is a certain amount of fearlessness, is none of us are afraid to fail. And if we're going to take a swing, we're going to take a big swing, and we're going to fail horribly. And it's going to be an incredibly ugly train wreck. So you can be, you can be part of it. And then we'll come back for some final thoughts. Maybe they'll be ours, maybe they'll be yours. Um, so the quick contest, I'll try to blow through this as quickly as I can. Uh, the big trend, and you can also call it the big assumption uh, that's going to under, uh, underlay our conversation for tonight, is that the single uh, most important thing that's going on in the world today is we're witnessing the evolution of capitalism. It's not about technology, it's not about social media, it's about the evolution of the most powerful man-made force that's ever been created, well, which is business, and the, and the evolution of the use of it for a higher purpose than just making money. And we're in the middle of a transition from the 20th century, which was dominated by a particular form of capitalism that was dominated by the shareholder, where there was a single rule in the operating system, uh, which was to maximize shareholder value. We're in mid-transition to uh, a, 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 a next phase of capitalism, which is about the stakeholder, where it's not about the dominant interest of one stakeholder, the investor, but a more balanced view of the, meeting the needs of all stakeholders. And so we're basically demanding of businesses and creating businesses and supporting businesses that are able to walk and chew gum at the same time. They're able to create both social and shareholder value simultaneously. What that means is that uh, these stakeholder capitalists, uh, a bunch of whom are in the room and some of whom are on stage, are redefining what it means to be successful in business. It's no longer just about how much profit can you make and how many jobs can you create. Those are important, but they are necessary but insufficient to meet either our economic needs or let alone our human needs or ecological, uh, recognizing our ecological constraints. So the quickest way to think about this is uh, stakeholder capitalists are creating high quality jobs and simultaneously using their business to improve our quality of life. And they're doing it both for current and for future generations. However, there's a pretty huge problem. Landmines, speed bumps, which is the current system wasn't set up to do this. The intentions that are manifesting in the marketplace, whether they be among consumers, investors, policymakers, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, uh, workers, uh, have evolved more quickly than our institution's ability to catch up. And so there are three of those uh, uh, barriers to growth or system constraints that myself and my uh, partners and co-founders of a nonprofit called B-Lab see. There are many others, and I'm hoping they're going to be one of the first things we're going to do is figure out what some of those other ones are or figure out better solutions than we have to these three problems. But three that we see from talking with thousands of entrepreneurs and others around the world is that <coughs> current corporate law, particularly in the U.S., is not particularly supportive of pursuing a triple bottom line. In fact, in many states, uh, it's pretty hostile to that. We can talk more about that later. Second thing is there aren't any great standards for what distinguishes a good company from just good marketing. And the third is that those entrepreneurs, like many of you in the room, whether you are starting a new business or trying to grow an established business, find it particularly hard to find uh, capital 
at any time in history, particularly so now, given the economic crisis, the long tail of the recession, tight credit markets, uh, et cetera, equity uh, capital on the sidelines, but doubly so because you're trying to, again, walk and chew gum at the same time, and sometimes that story is difficult to tell to the investment community. So it's very difficult to get capital these types of businesses. So those are, those are three sort of system constraints. Uh, myself, my partner, Bart Houlihan, Andrew Kasoy, uh, and the 25 people across the country now that work for this nonprofit called B-Lab saw those three constraints and said, what can we do to help uh, alleviate or mitigate those constraints or those barriers? And so we created a nonprofit organization that's dedicated to serving the world's leading entrepreneurs that are trying to use business as a force for good, trying to use business to solve social and environmental problems. And we do that through three things. Uh, certifying a growing and supporting a growing community of B corporations, trying to use that community of companies to be a powerful business constituency for supportive public policies, and then uh, using the standards that we use to certify those companies to help investors drive more capital to higher impact investments. I'm not going to talk about all three of those things, but the first two are a little bit related to how this talk was teed up, and so I'm just going to talk about them really briefly. One of the big needs that we talked about was, was the lack of standards. One way to think about that is not that no standards exist, but that no standards are looking at the company as a whole. Whether it's fair trade or organic or green buildings, those are three of 533 certifications that exist. Like the world doesn't need another certification, right? Another little button to put on our overcrowded bags and boxes and, you know, store windows and et cetera. However, the world needs another certification. Because each of those little individual component parts don't tell you the whole story. And just like you don't show up to work with an arm or a leg or an ear or a nose, you show up as a whole person, you want to support a whole company. You don't just want to uh, say, oh, that's great that you're in a LEED certified building, but the people inside are being treated poorly. What you're shipping out the front is actually uh, unhealthful, and what you're dumping out the back is harmful uh, to your local community. The fact that you're in a green building is nice, but it's necessary but insufficient. So how do we widen the aperture in our lens so that we're no longer looking at just for good products, but we're beginning to look for good companies. It might be relevant to let everybody know that our companies are all B corporations. An excellent segue to our next slide, which is that, that first sort of foundational uh, activity that B-Lab does is to certify companies the same way USGBC certifies green buildings or fair trade certifies you know, bags of coffee. But well, we look at the whole business. You left all three of our companies off the slide. Because there's all <laughs> kinds of good stuff up there about you guys later. Just oh, wait. Okay. All right. There'll be due, there'll be due okay. kissing of the rings shortly. All right. I'm looking forward to that part. Yeah. That's, that's my favorite part. It is. It is. Um, so th there's a growing community. We've been certifying B Corps now for a little over five years. There's now about 540 certified B Corporations from over 60 industries across 40 states and now uh, across eight countries that have all met these rigorous independent standards of social and environmental performance, accountability, and transparency. Some of the names up there you'll know. They're pretty well-known uh, consumer brands. Some of them you won't, but they're even bigger companies that are doing OEM industrial manufacturing in the Midwest or uh, uh, you know, B2B businesses like Raleigh Software here in, 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 in Colorado or energy businesses like Namaste but down in, uh, in the South, like Southern Energy Management. Um, one of, the th one of the things that's most inspiring to me about this community of businesses is not only that they're banding together as brothers and sisters to be more powerful together than each of them could be independently for their business, like creating a collective brand power that they wouldn't have had individually, but they're also doing much more than that. One of the things that they're doing is that community of companies is becoming a very powerful political constituency to pass supportive legislation that helps to advance the cause of sustainable business, social enterprise, impact investing. One of those things that uh, two of the three of us have worked on together here in Colorado is to pass legislation to create a new corporate form. You've heard of C-Corps, S-Corps, LLCs, partnerships, et cetera. So we're creating a new corporate form called a benefit corporation, uh, which is often and incorrectly shortened into a B Corp. Um, and those benefit corporations just provide a new tool for investors or entrepreneurs who want to build a business that's trying to create social and shareholder value the freedom and the legal protection to do so without the fear of being sued for a breach of fiduciary duty for caring about more than just their own pockets when they're building their business. Eight states have passed that legislation with unbelievable, it's awesome, with unbelievable uh, bipartisan support. 
in, in those eight states, there have been 11 unanimous floor votes, including in North Carolina, in South Carolina, in Virginia, in Louisiana, in Illinois. It's not just sort of Berkeley, Boulder, <laughs> Burlington. Some have said that the B must start, must be because of those things, and maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Um, but there are also lots of other places that we don't normally think of as co-travelers on this journey that are all seeing this as a market-based solution that, can, that they can support. Um, and there are 10 states moving forward. We, we may talk about it later on, about a little snag that we hit here in Colorado, but we're hoping that together we can do some of this uh, in Colorado in 2013. Um, so that's a little bit of the context for who I am, what I'm doing, what some of the things that we're working on together. Now I want to give you uh, a little bit of a brief intro about each of the three, uh, in turn, each of the three uh, uh, co-panelists here, and then I'm going to be asking them each some questions just to sort of get it going, and Brian will, will delightedly interrupt uh, often. So, so Kim Kupinas, we'll, we'll go ladies first. Um, you see Kim up there on the upper left-hand portion of the screen, incredibly laden, overladen down. <laughs> Granted, it's winter, so it's a little bit of a, of the, the fix is in. Um, and her and her husband, Coop, uh, a little bit later on, realizing that it was an awful lot more fun and effective to, to be an outdoor athlete if you were traveling light. Uh, better for you, better for the environment. Yep. And so they created a company with that as its mission called Go Light. Um, and Kim Kupinis is the co-founder and chief sustainability officer and one-time CEO of, of Go Light, uh, the premier global manufacturer of lightweight, high-performance, responsible apparel and equipment designed specifically for outdoor athletes. She's also, and importantly to our conversation here tonight, uh, the past chairman of the board of the Outdoor Industry Association, the OIA, that represents nearly $300 billion industry in the outdoor industry and has served on its advisory committee uh, for its sustainable working group, which developed something called the OIA, OIA Eco Index, uh, which is a pretty groundbreaking tool that enables apparel manufacturers to quantify the sustainability practices throughout their supply chain, all the way from crop to uh, cash register. She also currently serves as the chairman of the board for the OIA Political Action Committee uh, and, and is advisor to and visiting lecturer at the Bainbridge Graduate Institute. Uh, she became a certified B Corp back in 2008 and led efforts here in Colorado, including testifying in front of, uh, I don't forget which house, uh, but one of the Col uh, Colorado legislatures uh, in support of Colorado Benefit Corp legislation. She's got degrees from Princeton and Harvard, which you shouldn't hold against her. Um, and uh, among her deep passions are time spent with her family, trail running, hiking, singing, doing yoga, martial arts, drinking great wine, and climbing mountains. And so if you want to do some yoga and buy her a nice glass of red later on, <laughs> she will gladly receive. So Kim. My, my first question for you is uh, you've talked a lot about Go Light's long-term goal to become net positive, not just, to, not just to reduce your bad, but to get into the plus column around your environmental impact. Um, and you say that, in that in the, on that path that you're actually improving your product quality and your technical performance, not sacrificing them in the pursuit of sustainability. I don't believe you, and neither do they. <laughs> And so I'd like to know how it's possible to do that, because everything that we've been told, and often in our own businesses, we see that as, an, as a total trade-off. And so how is it possible to actually improve product quality around sustainability measures, but also around performance measures? Wow, I thought these were all going to be softballs, Jay. You got it. That's <laughs> as soft as they get. Thank you very, very much for the kind introduction. Greetings. Hello. Um, that is a great question. Um, I, I see our long-term quest as similar to the John F. Kennedy statement of the desire to attain the moon when he told the country that it told America that he, we were going to go to the moon within the next decade there was a lot of kind of guffaws and there's no way it's going to happen and um, but then the country set about the effort of trying to figure out how to do that and that's kind of how we look at um, how do you get to a, a truly sustainable business model one that has no net negative impact on the environment or on the people that work work on behalf of your brand um, and the journey so far, since we kind of set that bold as a statement back in 2008, um, has been kind of two steps forward, one step back. Um, we look at every single product that we make and um, look hard for the right materials to put into that product to be able to serve an outdoor athlete that's sometimes hiking multi-thousand mile through hikes or climbing Mount Everest. Um, and sometimes we've had to make, sometimes we've found awesome material or awesome um, things that we can build into the products that have radically smaller foot environmental footprints that are made in great factories. And then other times we'll be trying to, trying to design a product that's for, uh, that, that, that 
needs to be in a line that's made for that kind of outdoor activity, but there's nothing available in the marketplace yet. So we've often had times had to make the hard decision to include that in the product line, but knowing that it's not the most green product that we could put, we could put forward. Um, but the times that we do make the decision about um, changing out, swapping out materials, knowing that it's a better choice for people and planet, um, has always been in the, in the direction of a product that was better than its predecessor. Um, the materials are stronger, or they breathe better, or they keep rain off better, um, or by they're accident, lighter. By accident, Kim, or because that's part of your standard? Because it's part of our standard. We, we refuse to, to build products that are so-called greener if it, if, it takes, if it makes a sacrifice. And when you set that, that stake in the ground and, mm -hmm. and you go out to your suppliers and you say, I'm sorry, that's not good enough, and they come back to you the following season with something better, that's when you start driving change. Because all of us will have a supply chain of some sort, and there's oftentimes we can't control exactly what's, what's happening, but we can influence a lot. And if you set out a really bold vision, people will follow and people will try to meet that vision with you. That, that's awesome. Thank you. I, I'm curious, and this is a little bit of a preview for some of our conversation later, is you've set out a pretty ambitious mission for yourself and for Go Light and some pretty lofty goals. And I, I always associate the outdoor industry as a pretty much of a loner's type of thing, like it's solitude and you're kind of out there with the big vista and the, the, this gurgling stream. Uh, but you seem to actually seek out community in a way that I find pretty uh, unusual mm -hmm. among business leaders. Um, whether it's with the OIA group and the Eco Index, or lending your support for the Benefit Corporation. I'm just wondering why you insist on making your life so complicated by dealing with so many other people all the time. <laughs> I like people. I like you, Jay. We, we can't do this alone. We, we need to do this in community. The outdoor industry example is a great example where there were lots of really neat little companies, Patagonia and, and Golight and MEC and REI, and companies doing really working hard to change what we were doing and trying to reduce our footprint, but it wasn't until about four years ago when a, a, a group of, it started out as like five people from the industry, turned out to be about 175 companies came together to drive these, to develop these standards together, to ask the hard questions about how do we change our supply chain, how do we make sure the factories are getting better from a social compliance standpoint and an and a, uh, environmental standpoint. How do we how do we collectively change our industry? How do we collectively reduce the footprint of our industry that we finally started to, to realize that there was so much wisdom throughout the industry that was just kind of in silos? And when we finally started having conversations that were non-competitive and were really about, sorry to be cliched, but doing good in the world, amazing things happens, happen. We would get together and we've produced a public um, standard set of standards around um, how to reduce the footprint of, of apparel and textiles in the outdoor industry and, and broader textile industries that are world class and are being looked at by lots of other industries and companies to, to, so that they can learn how to, how to reduce their, their impacts. I think that's great. And so the, like, the two things that I take out of what you've shared so far are the importance of setting uh, a purpose, setting an intention, starting with an intention, and then the second is the, the importance of collaboration uh, and working with others and getting there, that it's Absolutely. not something you can do on your own. Yep. And so speaking of sort of collaboration, uh, there isn't a more collaborative sort of community-minded business than Namaste Solar. And, and not anybody that I've ever met that's embodied sort of that uh, spirit of humility more than in my, the time that I've known you, Blake. And so m many of you may know uh, Blake. Um, he's got lots of friends. Some of them you <laughs> see up there on the lower right. Maybe probably his most important friends there on the lower right, which are his his co-owners uh, in, in Namaste Solar, and then a few other uh, uh, friends of his on the, le on the lower left that came into town a couple of years ago. Um, and so there's an interesting, uh, the reason I put that there is not to sort of name drop or whatever, or to, to pump up your ego, but just to sort of subliminally just talk about the, no the, the importance of policy issues, uh, either as a barrier or as an accelerator in something that we do. And so maybe that's something that we'll address at some point. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, Blake, uh, has got extensive experience in both renewable and conventional energy industries. And like most people uh, at LOHAS, uh, he's worked uh, in, in many places over his career, including at Halliburton. I mean, who, who hasn't? Um, and, and in the oil and gas industry, if I had a nickel for every LOHAS uh, community member who's out of Halliburton in oil and extractive industries, um, I'd be a wealthy man. So he, he, it's practically a breeding ground, Halliburton. It, it, is, it is incredible. Yeah. It's incredible. Um, uh, one of the things that you did is you had a two-year stint in Egypt where, and I'm, and I'm quoting, 
from something on your website, not putting it in your mouth, after a life-changing epiphany, you decide to leave the industry and dedicate your life to propagating the use of renewable energy. You moved to Nepal in 2001 and spent the next three years implementing solar, wind, and hydro and electric vehicle technologies. After three years, you came back to Boulder uh, to co-found Namaste Solar. Uh, you hold, a, you hold a, a BE in civil engineering uh, from the south, also a typical breeding ground for this type of stuff, and you're a certified solar PV installer, like you got the chops, um, not just the vision, um, and that you enjoy hiking, traveling, playing the sitar, and practicing Tai Chi, and aren't we all impressed? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, it's very Boulder <laughs> representative. Yeah, I'm just trying to, you know, like build the, build the bonds here, sitar, Tai Chi, martial arts, and yoga. <laughs> um, so so one, one of my opening questions for you, Blake. Halliburton. Halliburton, yeah. you know, yeah. Is, is one of the things that I find really intriguing is you, you've always been, or at least from early on, been an employee-owned company, which is like one step out there for a typical entrepreneur who always wants the chips for themselves. But recently, within the last 12 or 15 months, I forget, you, you sort of took it to the next level and uh, became an employee-owned cooperative. And similar, as a follow-up to what I asked to Kim, like, why the heck would you do that and complicate life so much further? Uh, you already distributed the ownership. Uh, why would you also distribute uh, decision making? Uh, <clears throat> the short answer isn't very exciting, but I think it was because we didn't know any better when we started the company. <laughs> uh, I think if we would have known about cooperatives when we started the company, and we were all naive, first time entrepreneurs, we didn't know any better, so we invented our own wheel. If we would have known about cooperatives, we would have started as one. And I think only later on we were like, ah, that's what we should have done. And so it took us a while, but uh, we were already operating as a cooperative. It, was, it really matched our intentions to share ownership, to have it be you know, one person, one vote, it was all the employees controlling the, the company. So but why, we made the is it, why is that important to your business, or why is it important to you personally to do that? I felt like that was a better way to do business. I, 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 I didn't want to be an entrepreneur that was the only one not sleeping at night that was the only one. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> you know, I, I didn't. I didn't want all the. Um, I didn't want all the burden and the baggage of having all the responsibility and accountability on me. I, I wanted to share the experience. And <laughs> but nice. I, I, I talk about the negative things because I think that's important. I think when a lot of people think of employee ownership, they think of the positives. Oh, we get to share some profits, and I get to vote, and I get to do these things. Yeah, but there's a there's a flip side to that too, and it's you're going to share the responsibility. You're going to share the accountability. You're going to have to put capital into the into the company. You're going to have to mortgage your house too, and you're going to be. I, I can call you at 3 a.m. and I know you're not sleeping either. Um, <laughs> But we, we, yeah, I just thought it was a better way to do business. We, we thought that if everyone is thinking and acting like an owner, and it's yeah. truly shared, uh, the, the whole small business ownership experience, that we could achieve some amazing things. And, and so, so far, let, so let good. Let me push a little bit on that, because yeah. it, it's fairly trite to, to hear or to read about, oh, this is a better way to do business, that's a better way to do business, yeah. there's a business case for sustainability, there's a business case for that, and yada, yada, yada. And so can you, can you give me some, something tangible or can you, more importantly than me, can you, can you share with folks here, some of whom may have never considered employee ownership or distributed decision making, uh, or some of them who might now be interested in it, like a little bit more specifically, but what, what makes it a better way to do business as opposed to a better way to feel about uh, the business? Ultimately, the only way we'll be able to prove this is over a long period of time. It's one thing to do it for a year or two years. It's another thing to do it for seven years. I think only when we've been an industry leader for 20 years compared to other benchmarks in the solar industry can we really say, there it is, proof from the pudding, this yep. is one of, but one of the But you think why. it'll make you more productive is what you're saying. Yes. You think you'll be a more I productive think, I think the, the things that we measure are 70% of our customers come from referrals. Our retention rate is above 90%. Um, you know, turnover costs money. We think we have significantly higher retention rate than our competitors. Our customer satisfaction rates are extremely high when measured by the people who actually return the surveys. To be fair, not everybody's returning one, but we have about a 40% response rate. Customer satisfaction rates are really high. We have really low, in the construction industry, you know, rework costs. Right. When we install them, when we install solar systems, our level of quality is higher, so we're going back to do service and maintenance issues to correct problems that we made the first time. We're doing that a lot less than our competitors. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the ways in which it's showing up. Right, like I think of it as when, when our family was thinking about uh, 
going solar. We couldn't because we didn't want to cut down the huge tree that was creating the shade and all the rest. But like it was the notion of having somebody come to do that and do the installation who was an owner in the business rather than just sort of a contractor to put it up and then would be would roll. Yeah. Uh, just intuitively to me as a consumer would would make sense that that would lead to better quality work. Yeah, we're punching holes in your roof. You know, do you do you want uh, right. yeah an employee owner to do it or four employee owners and a crew to do it or would do you want four people who may not be there in a month? Right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the uh, uh, I want to I want to turn it to Brian now, saving saving uh, uh, the most beautiful and abundant conversation for last. Um, so so Br Brian Brian Welch, you'll 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 recognize the plug for that in a second. Um, so Brian runs Ogden Publications. Many of you have probably not heard of Ogden Publications, but have probably bought many of their magazines if you've ever been to Alfalfa's or to Whole Foods or other places like that where they pretty much own the racks. Um, you'll recognize folks like Mother Earth News and. Utney Reader and Natural Home and Garden and Herb Companion and lots of other things. Um, it's the largest uh, sustainable lifestyles publisher in the U.S., uh, 11 magazines in total. Um, uh, all category leaders in print and I imagine importantly online too. I've heard that that's coming up these days. Me too, uh, I've heard that also. Yeah, yeah. Um, tip, hot tip. Um, uh, you heard it here. You heard it here first. Um, cutting edge, cutting edge. Uh, Ogden also has its own sort of multi-million dollar natural home products line. So you have sort of a, a, a small business entrepreneur doing, doing uh, natural products um, to this very customer base, sort of discerning skeptical customer base, which I think is kind of useful. You're also responsible uh, for the legacy of the, I love this, the longest continuously published periodical in the United States. Quick, first drink on me. What is it? Uh, you're right, Waylon. You weren't supposed to guess. All right, next. Double or nothing for Waylon. Uh, <laughs> when was it first published? What was the year it was first published? 1871. Give me the right century. 1871. Eh, 1792. My man's holding on to something that's like a couple hundred, that's pretty awesome. You got to be a steward of something that's a couple hundred years old. That's, that's pretty cool. And a big responsibility. So you owe that old school thing, but you also recently published a book called uh, Beautiful and Abundant, Building the World We Want. Um, uh, while you're not doing all those things, you're busy raising grass fed cattle, sheep, and goats with your wife on your 50-acre farm near Lawrence, Kansas, Rock Chalk Jayhawk. And so what I, what I want, I've served with, with Brian on the, on the Social Venture Network board for a while, and so I've come to appreciate all of his shy, uh, reserved, uh, and um, very uh, overly diplomatic way of sharing his thoughts. And so, you know, uh, there's a chance that some of these people might actually like me, Jay, if you don't. Yeah. Well, I, I'm trying to give them more opportunity by, by, shrink, by shrinking the amount of time you can speak. Yes, thanks. Um, that might work. <laughs> that might work. So, so, uh, uh, so it, the, the, the lead up to this, to this session says, in an, in an age of increasing cynicism, yada, yada, yada. I don't know anybody more cynical. Um, and so, in, in an age of increasing cynicism, Brian, not to mention unprecedented inequality, persistent poverty, uh, environmental degradation, you write a business book called Beautiful and Abundant. And I'd like to know what you see that others don't. Well, I, I, uh, I went to high school and college here in Boulder County, so I've seen a lot of things that other people don't. Uh, it was in the 70s. And, um, but actually, I think you're wrong on most of the points that, uh, that you make. I made. usually am. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there is persistent poverty, but there are fewer poor people as a percentage now than there have ever been. Mm -hmm. We are less violent. We are healthier. We live longer. Mm -hmm. And all of those things are the product of human visualization. Not, all, not always obviously the product, not always in the time frame. Mm -hmm. we'd, we'd like to see them materialize. But basically, we've created a world that is safer and healthier and less violent and more prosperous, and humanity is better off on an individual by individual basis than humanity has ever been before. Any way you cut the numbers, we have realized the things we visualized. Mm -hmm. And today, we are finally asking capitalism, a relatively new invention, mm -hmm. to serve the greater purpose of improving the lives of future generations even further mm -hmm. than they've been improved so far. And so, I mean, in a nutshell, I think it's both, both the greatest promise we have as a species and, uh, in a way, the greatest burden that we face. Mm -hmm.
that it seems that the things we visualize, we visualize longer lifetimes, greater health, greater prosperity, less violence. And those things become real in the world. Mm -hmm. Right now, though, we're at this interesting turning point where visualizing a sustainable human presence on the planet is tough because no uh, organism has ever voluntarily limited its own expansion uh, in favor of preserving a habitat. We're the only species that can conceptualize our impact on our own habitat. Mm -hmm. And so this, this is a visualization product that's project, rather, that's unlike any other mm -hmm. past visualization. Mm -hmm. And it's intriguing, it's challenging, maybe a little intimidating. And so maybe this is like a good segue into like engaging uh, the rest of the community in the conversation is, it is all those things. Uh, what, what do you see as the biggest uh, barriers, challenges? You, you sit at a unique vantage point, right? You, you're in conversation with uh, millions of uh, consumers, citizens, fel fellow human beings in the United States that are, on, that are thinking about this stuff um, and yet uh, don't always act consistent with those thoughts. Uh, and I'm just curious, what, what, what do you see as someone who's got probably a bigger, a better window uh, to actual behavior as opposed to commentary uh, among those millions of Lojas consumers or cultural creatives or conscious consumers, uh, what's, or investors for that, however you want to frame it, like what do you see as some of the disconnects? Um, the, the power source for creating the world that we want our great-grandchildren to live in is the consumer. That's the power source. Mm -hmm. The existing uh, governments, existing multinational corporations, the existing infrastructure okay. has a lot invested in keeping the consumer in the consumer's present mindset, limiting the consumer's expectations. Mm -hmm. So I think that the key to creating the world I want my great-grandchildren to live in is to awaken the consumer mm -hmm. to the potential of business, to awaken the consumer to the potential for change that they hold in their hands, in their buying habits. Why would you mm -hmm. buy a pound of coffee that degrades the environment in Costa Rica in a way that destroys, destroys bird species and insect species. If you could buy a pound of coffee, even if it cost a few cents more, that preserved the habitat for those animals. Well, knowing that, most consumers would make the right decision, I think. Mm -hmm. But there's a huge infrastructure in place to limit consumers, consumer expectations. Uh -huh. And I think my job in a large part, is raising consumer expectations, raising the prospect yep. that they can make a huge difference in the world by asking the right questions. And I often point to the fact that the biggest core, the most valuable company in the world fundamentally changed its human resource policies in response to one more or less bogus story about morale in a factory in China just this past year. Well, that's an earth-shaking move. That's a lot of resources changing place over one more or less bogus story. Well told. You're referring to the Apple. And the Apple and the, and the, yep. uh, the Foxconn thing. Yep. Um, it, it was well told. It was a compelling narrative. And it speaks to the power that consumers have. And it speaks to the transparency we're going to be operating in in the world going forward. I think it's tremendously exciting, mm -hmm. but we do have to face the fact that big established institutions have a lot invested in not letting consumers awaken to their potential. It's a I think, it's like yeah, I think consumer awareness is a, a big part of it and transparency of what, what's really going on, companies are really doing. But I think also the example of the two bags of coffee with costs being externalized in so many ways that they are, if one of those bags of coffee is twice as expensive no matter how aware the consumer is, that's only going to do so much. Right. I think if we can work on some of those externalized costs and make companies truly accountable for, you know, not just, I mean, whenever, when people think of external, externalities, it's not just damage to the environment, but it's also to society and to public health and, and, and things like that. If we can find a way to, for the true costs, for, for companies to be held accountable for the true costs of things, I think that'll that combined with consumer awareness and better transparency, that, that'll be powerful. 
Yeah, that raising the consumer's awareness of, awareness of externalities. I mean, even even e Econ 101 students don't like to discuss e externality. It's a it's a sticky, difficult process. It's messy. But you know, it, we're in, we live in a world where we have the opportunity. This multimedia opportunity to explain a lot more than we ever could before. Sure. And you know, I thought Kim said something super important. And it's it, it, this is important both on the cost side as well as on the quality side in terms of our products. As business people, I, don't you think that we have to be ready to compete head to head before we overlay the conscientiousness? Yep. We have to be ready to compete head to head on every other basis. And then we can overlay the conscientiousness and feel very good about doing that. I, I think that's true to a certain extent. Uh, Kimball Musk was talking about that this morning that uh, at the end of the day you have to have a good product, run a good business, do it all well. And, and the way we've always thought of it at Namaste Solar is all the, all the other stuff, that could be a tiebreaker. Let that be the tiebreaker, but you need to compete head on with business at the fundamental level. I, I agree with that a lot, but I do think that the system is set up to favor the bad competitors. You know, in some ways the game is a little bit rigged uh, against us, and I think there are some things that we can do to change that. Some of it is the, the externalizing costs. Um, some of it has to do with transparency. Another thing I think that you know, B Corporation is, is really hitting on is uh, shareholder primacy. That the entire system is set up to, to stockholder financial interests. That's number one. And, and directors can be sued. You know, they're legally mandated. They have a the fiduciary duty to, to look after uh, stockholders' financial interests over everything else. If they consider other stakeholders, they could leave the company liable or vulnerable, and we've got to change that. We've got to make that in all 50 states, not just half of them or whatever it is. We've got to have stakeholder statutes that protect companies that want to consider other stakeholders in their decision-making process and not only have to look out for the interests of, financial interests of stockholders.